Hello everyone, today is Thursday, September 24, 2015, and this is the week in charts. As a disclaimer screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Okay, what are we going to talk about? Well, um, one second. Well, I got a client email asking about money and position management. And I really have covered this quite a bit in my YouTube videos, but admittedly, my YouTube videos are a little, a uh, little being an um, understatement that word, but very much um, unorganized. And then I used to sell the flash drives. I haven't done that in more recent times, which had all of the weekend charts on them. And I don't know if I'll, I'll start doing that or not, but uh, I, I try to get as many of those as possible uploaded to YouTube for free. But anyway, so if you do go back and check, you'll get a lot more on that. But uh, I was asked uh, twice to cover this, so I'll go ahead and cover it. Uh, we do obviously have some daily and, more importantly, weekly signals trigger, I guess I've been talking about quite a bit. And my random thoughts are pretty much the same as last week, but we'll get into that in just one second. Hey, Dave, since we are in a non-trending situation, well, I wouldn't really call it a non-trending situation. I think we're... We're choppy short term, but we're in a developing situation. Throughout most of 2015, yes, we were in a non-trending, choppy, sideways market. But right now, we're just kind of in a short term pullback. It, I'll be in a choppy one, and setups are few and far between, as I'll mention here in just a few seconds, especially when we get to the charts. But I wouldn't call it I wouldn't call it trendless right now. I think the trend or the emerging trend is a downtrend, unfortunately. And we'll flesh all that in just one second. But anyway, hey Dave, since we are in a non-trending situation with few setups, that is true. We do have few setups. You might want to consider these three topics or three topics for your show. Position sizes, stop, placement, and trailing stops. I know you have referred me to the archives of these topics, but why not reinforce these skills? while all the sectors look like the overall market. Also, with the explosion of ETFs, aren't there several trending markets outside of stocks? Maybe don't have enough volatility, but finally, for those of us who don't want to short stocks, would you please offer short ETFs as alternatives to your short setups? Just some thoughts. Thanks for your service, Jim H. Well, I'll have quite a bit to say about the ETFs when we get to that, so let's just kind of cover a position sizing stop placement and trailing stop so again see the YouTubes on that because there's a lot more information in some shows for instance we covered like negative expectancy or the perceived well, I could I should call it the perceived negative expectancy and that was just a topic of of in and of itself for two shows and that was our meaning risk versus R, meaning reward. So I think it's vitally important to wrap your head around those things. And there is a lot more to it than what I'm saying here. But if you boil it all down, this is the gist of it. And, and you know, Jim's right. Maybe I should every now and then reinforce some of these um, basics, although I do feel like I'm, I do that quite often. But maybe not often enough. So position sizing, and I, I think I also forget that we have new people coming in at all times, but position sizing is pretty, pretty simple. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's that complex. In fact, before I get into position sizing, one thing I would urge you to do, and trust me, I've experimented with things over the years, and I've done a little bit of, of everything, and it's cost me a lot of money to do a little bit of everything, but I think in doing that, you learn some really valuable lessons. I don't want to digress too far, but you know, the, the, I guess the worst thing that happen when you're experimenting is to be successful in something that works shorter term, but not longer term. And that can really uh, get you in a lot of trouble. And that's the permanent income hypothesis thing that I think a lot of people kind of got caught up in a little bit too much in 2015. And then recently things began to unfold, which kind of erased all that. But uh, I don't want to digress too far. I'm kind of going off a tangent here. I didn't intend to go on. Imagine that. But position sizing is simply you want to risk 2% on each trade. Now, the point I want to make on that, and I think this is where I got off on the tangent, is that you need to be fixed in how much you risk. If you're just starting trading, maybe a quarter percent on every position. I talked to a trader a while back. 
years ago, like actually more than a while back. But anyway, and he was fairly successful, fairly quickly. And I asked him, I said, well, how did you do that? He says, well, I'm only risking $25 on a trade. And I'm not sure what markets he was trading to be able to do that. But I understood that maybe it's just kind of like a short little uh, tiny day trade or something. But I understand, you know, the point he was making is that it's so little money. And he had income and his wife has income. But it's so little money that the money doesn't really matter to him. So he's not getting all caught up in the emotional mistakes. When you're risking more and more money, then it becomes more important and more difficult. But the point I'm trying to make here, believe it or not, I do have one, is that you want to be consistent in your risk. You don't want to risk 2%, 2%, 2%, 2% lose three times in a row and get bummed out and then go into your next trade and risk one quarter of a percent. And, of course, that's going to be your big winner. But it's not going to make up for those three losing trade so i guess on the surface position sizing is just risk two percent but once you start digging into it and as i'm beginning to talk now i'm going to realize obviously there's a little bit more but you want to be consistent in whatever your risk is if you are just starting trading again quarter percent per position or even less i mean obviously you start by paper trading but i've never met an unsuccessful paper trader and by that i mean you've put the, you've put in the reps you put the time in and you understand the methodology you've, or you found a methodology that makes a lot of sense to you. And before you put real dollars on the, on the line, you, you test it. Once real dollars are put on the line, it gets a little bit more difficult. But when you do put those real dollars on the line, make sure you're consistently risking the same amount on every trade on a percentage basis. Because otherwise, as Murphy would have it, you're going to end up with your biggest positions and your losers and your smallest positions and your winners. And I've tried this before. And I've tried having a confidence level in, in all kinds of different things in trades. And I, I mean, I think that's what makes you a good trader is you do have to experiment. But at some time, at some point, you have to stop experimenting and just follow a certain thing, a certain methodology, a certain framework like I've been talking about over the last few weeks and stick with that. It's OK to tweak it a little bit. But don't make any major changes or any drastic changes, at least over the very short term. So 2%. I was thinking the other day, uh, I was out for a walk. It's a, how did I come up with 2%? And I think it was just something that was taught to me years and years ago. And it seems to be just enough to hurt if you're wrong, but you can live to fight another day. And it seems to be just enough to make a decent amount of money. If you're right, so say you're you're trading a 100K account and you've got 2% in a position. Well, obviously, if you lose barring overnight gaps, you lose 2% of your account. So now you got like $98,000. Well, then say you you win on one on half of it. So that means you make 1%. And then if that second loaf, even at a just a 1% position size turns into the mother of all winners, then those gains can be very substantial. It could be maybe 20% of your account and you could have a really good year just by catching one or two really big winners. Now, I probably overemphasize the fact or probably um, maybe exaggerate the fact or make it seem like it's impossible to find those selected stocks, but it does happen. And they do come along I'm not going to say not often enough, or but they come along just – they seem to come along just at the right time. And in the meantime, you have to chip away at it. So risk 2%, and that's if stopped out. And real simple, it's just let's say we have a 100K account, and then obviously put your account size in if you like. Um, and I think I, I have this in the spreadsheet I can give you if you like it. Uh, and let's say we're just going to use a $5 stop. We'll talk about stops here in just one second. But let's say 100K times 2% is $2,000 at risk. Well, you divide that by your stop, and that gives you the number of shares. It doesn't mean you run out and buy $2,000 worth of stock. Depending on the price of the stock, as I showed in, again, one of my YouTubes, that, that $5 risk could be a lot of margin or not much margin, okay, depending on the price of the stock based on 400 shares in this particular 
example. Now, of those 400, I like to divide them in two. You buy all 400 at one time or sell short, obviously, which might be the case in this particular market. And 200 is going to be the trading loaf, and 200 will be the trending loaf, okay? So we're going to try to get a swing trade on 200 shares, make a little money, make that five points, and we're going to hopefully have this one make a lot more. How many times are you stopped out compared to your winners? Uh, David, I don't know. Um, I really don't. I, I think tracking those type of metrics uh, is, is great in academic standpoints, from an academic standpoint. But from a reality standpoint, if you could catch that occasional winner and make twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, you could be stopped out a lot on your losing trades. Uh, when conditions are really well, I mean, obviously, you'll hit 100% for a while, 100% winners. But when conditions are really well, usually I'm hitting in about 70% ballpark. If I'm hitting that high, I'm having a hard time sleeping at night because I know that the market might just be an aberration for what I'm doing. I mean, I know I'm doing my homework and I know I'm doing the right thing, but it's almost like no one is that good, at least when you're swing to intermediate term trading. You could hit 90% and maybe even higher if you're, to quote the commodity adage, eating like a bird, defecating like an elephant, taking a bunch of little small gains, and then all of a sudden you get whacked on a trade. So I wouldn't get too caught up in the statistics of it all, I think that's where people get into a lot of trouble. I get emails almost every day about these systems that are ninety percent correct. Some people email me have that have developed these systems, and it's like, well, you had a forty percent drawdown. Oh, well, by the end of the year, it was profitable. Well, who can trade through a forty percent drawdown? I certainly can't, and that's uh, for all intents and purposes blowing up on a trade. So anyway, so let's say you're up five points, where you take profits at five points, and you make sure that stop is at remainder on the remainder to break even you move the stop to remainder on the break even and then you trail the stop loosely to hopefully ride out a longer term trend and i'll i'll walk you through this on a chart or in a um in a figure in a few minutes and the idea is to have your cake and eat it too trade for both short term and long term gains in fact the article just yesterday ironically i got the final proof uh final draft i should say back from traders magazine so over the next few days, I'll let them publish it first, but over the next few days, I'll go ahead and publish that article under free re free reports. And, and you guys see me do the, the presentations before, have your cake and eat it too, where we talk about how we're going for a sweet trade, but the real money is in the longer term trades. I'm sorry, longer term trends, okay? Now again, I did two week back to back um videos on the negative expectancy or how how that negative expectancy is beat so they're out there on youtube i just had to find them okay michael says position sizing is not too complex when you understand the stuff yeah absolutely Okay, thanks, David. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Martin, I can't click on uh, links um, in this, so you'll have to um, you have to send them to me. Now, so where do you place a stop? Well, it's an art as much as it is a science. But I will tell you this: after, first of all, it's common sense. Don't make it more complex than it has to be. It's not rocket science. It's not rocket surgery. Okay. Just eyeball the chart. Now, it does take a little time to eyeball a chart. But there's a few things that I could tell you to um, that will help. You have to be outside of the normal volatility, okay? The normal short-term volatility. So if a market, let's just redo this. If a market is doing this, let's just say that's a normal volatility. If your stop is anywhere within this range of the normal volatility, then you're likely to get stopped out, okay? And again, ultimately, you're gonna have to learn how to eyeball the charts, but you could, you, what can help is something like HV, that's historical volatility. If you have a stock that, let's say, has a historical volatility reading of 100, you know that that's a pretty 
pardon my French, crazy ass volatility. And you know that that stop is, I'm sorry, that stock is kind of all over the place. So make sure you have some really good structure in place. Make sure by structure I mean some sort of nice base, maybe a big old cup and handle pattern, maybe a, a big double bottom or some sort of structure in place. And then make sure you have a setup. And with that setup, make sure that the stock at least trades cleanly, at least over the fairly shorter term, meaning that it persists in one direction. Uh, it's an obvious setup. It's not an electrocardiogram. The stock isn't all over the place. So whenever you're getting into those really high HV stocks, just be really, really careful and know that it's going to be a wild ride. Um, average true range. I'm always asked about average true range. Uh, can you use average true range to, to set your stops? Absolutely. And if you boil my stop setting down, it's probably based on average true range. And I guess on every trade, you can look at where I place a stop. And then statistically, there's something that would statistically tell you to put that stop there. My concern with statistics is statistics are worthless. 75.3% of all people know that, right? But uh, on a serious note, statistics, the markets aren't normally distributed, so they don't adhere perfectly to statistics. But that's where your brain could come in, and there's certain things you could do to help make sure that that stop is, A, outside of normal volatility and that you don't get stopped out on a trade. By the way, I'm going to talk about uh, – I'm going to uh, soft sell my stock selection course here in a few minutes. But the bottom line is your best – Defense is a good offense, and that's going to solve a lot of psychological problems, too. If you're picking better stocks to begin with, and you're getting stopped out less, and you're making more money, then psychologically, you're going to be in the right mindset to pick even better stocks. As I've said quite a bit, if you take the mind and the methodology and the money management, okay, all three of those things are intertwined. It's like a three-stranded rope or a three-corded rope. If you get better with your mindset towards the markets, then your money management is going to be better, and then the methodology is going to improve, okay? Or, as I just said, you get better with the methodology, you get better with your stock picking, then your money management is going to get better, and then the psychology is going to be there. You're going to know that, of course, you're going to have some losing trades, and of course, you're going to need some money management to take care of those, but you're going to have more winners if you're picking the best stocks to begin with. Now, the question you need to ask yourself is, where would you be wrong? One pattern that I tend to like is I like a, a, a first pullback after a base breakout. So you've got a nice little base, and then all of a sudden, the market begins to take off. Now, we don't buy it right here, as a lot of people would ask me. Well, why don't you buy it right there? Well, because except for certain conditions, such as in IPOs, as a general statement, breakouts tend to fail. And it's like, why? Well, because everybody now has a computer on their desk. If you go back and read some of these books about these traders that became famous just by buying breakouts, I can tell you right now that doesn't really work in today's markets and you'll probably end up uh, ruining an account just doing that. Now, there are still some people that trade breakouts. So a few years back, somebody told me they were trading breakouts and they told me that their percent correct was abysmal, but their money management was such that they could occasionally catch the big home run. Well, that kind of sounds like me at points in time. You know, I'd, in fact, I'd rather have, I'd rather have a 30% correct win rate provided of course within that 30 percent i had a few big winners than a 70 percent correct win rate where i just had a bunch of mediocre winners okay and that's happened before i've had a very high high percent correct but i'm only making like a thousand on a trade per 100k and getting stopped out on the remainder and that doesn't do me much good i'd much rather make 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 per 100K. So I'd make a 20, 30, 40% return just on that one trade and then have the other ones. I mean, ideally, I'd like them all to be winners, but the reality is it's not going to happen. But so I'm okay with 
a few losing trades as long as there's an occasional big winner mixed in. So anyway, before I get digress too far on that, let's say you do get in a stock. It looks like it's got first pullback after that base breakout, and then it rolls over and tanks. Well, you know that if it comes all the way back to the base, you're wrong. And then in some cases, you might actually have to stop even a little bit higher because at some point, it's obviously it's going to return to the base. So that's something to think about, okay? Now, let's say that you're trading an emerging trend. It's something that looks like this. It begins to take off. Cup and handle, bow tie, whatever you want to call it, first thrust or whatever it shapes up to be. And let's say you get in and then it rolls right back over. Well, if it goes on to make new lows and you're trying to buy this particular market, it could be any market, Forex, stock, whatever, it doesn't matter, then you know right here you're wrong because maybe this longer-term downtrend is resuming. Okay, so ask yourself, am I outside of the normal volatility? And ask yourself, where would I be wrong? And then also ask yourself, am I in the best stock to begin with? Okay, and of course, you got to factor other things too, like are market conditions worthwhile? We're looking at a couple of possible longs right now, but I got to tell you, I, I would be. I'd be happy if they didn't trigger. It wouldn't bother me, at least. I mean, in an ideal world, yeah, they trigger and I make a lot of money. But given the conditions right now, I'm being super selective. And I've only got two on my radar right now. And I'm surprised that I even have any. And we'll touch upon that in a few minutes. So, again, if it goes down and makes new lows, then obviously your new trend is not emerging and your old trend is continuing. continuing. Now, pullbacks are a little tougher admittedly okay let's say you get in a pullback trade right here let's do this again let's say you get in right here in a pullback and then it begins rolling back over well the question is how far do you let it pull back before the trade is considered no longer a viable trade now how many in here and and you don't have to answer in chat because it'll fill up the chat room i'm sure but just, just uh, you know, raise your hand if you're at home. <laughs> How many in here have ever gotten stopped out and then watched the market, uh, to the penny even, and then watch the market turn around and go straight back up? I'm sure we all have. We all have that T-shirt. We probably have a closet full of those T-shirts. It happens, spelled with silent S-H, okay? And that's the tough part. And that's where the market could be a bad teacher. I don't want to digress too far, as I normally do, but <laughs> – but, that says that makes you think, oh well, I'm just not going to use stops next time, and then what happens? You get wiped out. So sooner or later, you will get stopped out to the penny. The market's going to turn around, and go straight back up, and and to put it mildly, it's going to piss you off. Okay, but it happens. It comes with the territory. That's what you're signing up for. So it is a big question mark as to how far to let it pull back. Now, on sometimes you have a really deep pullback before it takes off again. Let's say this is before you get in. It pulls back deeply. So it really shouldn't go too much further past this deep pullback. So sometimes this rubber band is stretched in one direction so far that it really shouldn't go much further. If you're trading a shallower pullback, then what can happen is, let's say you're trading a shallow pullback like this. Then when it begins to correct, you could get that deep pullback in here. Okay. And I don't want to get into percentages or anything like that, but it could be, as far as like percentage this this leg higher because i don't really use a, a certain percentage retracement at least not too much i kind of eyeball it a little bit but you could have some pretty serious deep retracements especially if this move higher is a sharp move higher and an accelerated move higher so say you got a stock that does this okay i'm only interested in this stock if it has a really deep retracement i'm trying to think of one we had one recently that had a deep retracement and then like it did trigger, and like the following day, it drops another 30 or 40 percent. So you want to see, I think it was EFOI, if memory serves, or something like that. So you want to see, especially if that market's going straight up, you want to see a pretty deep retracement before you even think about getting on. And if you get on in a shallow pullback, just be ready for a deep retracement, unless you get really lucky, okay? And that's why I would much better, much better, much rather wait for that deep retracement. So, again, pullbacks are a little tougher. Um, it's as bit of an art as it is a science. Again, not to beat the dead horse in that when it comes to um, 
stocks, stop placement, I should say. Okay. All right, any questions on stop placement? I know we could probably talk hours on this. Um, okay, Bill Dunn can trade to 40% drawdowns. Well, okay, I mean, if if you have to be really confident in your system to go through that kind of a drawdown, and, and to me, if you are going to have that kind of drawdown and you are confident in your system, maybe trade – with maybe trade at half that size, so you're only experiencing a 20% drawdown. Yeah, you might get, you might not make as much money, but at least you're within um, decent parameters as far as recovery. Remember, if you lose 50% of your money, you got to make back 100%, and that just gets you back to break even. So the more money that you lose, the more money you have to make back geometrically. So you can get into a lot of trouble really, really quickly. So be careful with that type of stuff, okay? You're welcome, Jim. Jim says, nice explanation. Thanks for addressing my email. You're welcome. Uh, don't worry about aggressive trend traders have these nasty 40% plus drawdowns. Well, yeah, but the problem is, and I've been, I've been there and done that, and I have the T-shirt too, okay? I did a lot of long-term trend following early in my career, gravitated towards the short term, and then ended up being a little bit of both. And that's my hybrid approach to the markets. And I think, I think that that's the best approach to the markets. And I've been on some uh, professional teams without going into a lot of details. And they're like, hey, you know, I thought everybody do that, like Pinocchio being a bad motivational speaker. You know, I see potential in you and you. But I thought everybody knew that you could only predict the short term and that you could stick around with some of the position for the longer term to kind of have your cake and eat it too. But evidently, everyone doesn't know that, okay? And, and, and again, it's not by way or highway. So you have to do what's right for you. But the beauty of the short term and the longer term combined is a hybrid approach, as I've said quite a bit, as someone's asked me before, is your money management psychological or statistical? And the answer is yes. You're getting that short term need for gratification in this microwave society we live in, okay? So you're getting that short-term need for gratification, but you're all stroking that longer-term ego. Now, I don't want to get too far and digress and let uh, freshman psychology rear its ugly head, but I think it all has to deal, it all kind of boils down to that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And if you go look at my, uh, if you put in Maslow and search on my website, you'll see the article that I wrote on that. By the way, I've got probably a thousand articles out there uh, or daily random thoughts, whatever you want to call them. There's a lot of good stuff in there. One day I'm going to, uh, I'll find a little kid or something that's willing to do it, do a little cutting and paste and put it all together and organize that for me. In fact, I need somebody, I need somebody to organize all this information. I throw out a lot of information and I really need somebody to organize it. But before I digress too far, so as much as an art as a science, if you have three trade losses in a row happens, but a 40% hit three times, you won't be trading for long. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and that's the problem with that, that uh, if you read uh, Curtis Faith's book, they talk about a 70% drawdown. Well, 70% drawdown, I mean, at some point, at some point, you really have to question yourself and pull the plug. And you know, like like someone who emailed me with a with the with the short term trading system that had a forty percent drawdown drawdown. If you're showing me a long term trading system and you got a forty percent drawdown, then okay, that's fine. Uh, not that I want to trade that. I mean, take a look at like some of these famous value players, and I'm not going to point anybody out because I live in a glass house, I suppose. But if you plot their publicly traded funds, they occasionally draw down fifty percent. <laughs> there's no guarantee it's going to stop at 50%, but I guess they've been around the block long enough to know that eh, it's probably due to turn at 50%. Well, I can't live through that. But if you're trading a short-term system where you have very limited gains and potential unlimited losses, then you hit that 40% drawdown, and it's going to take you a long, 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 long time to make back that 40%. 
Whereas I could see where these people that are long, long, long term value players or whatever. And at some point in time, I guess things become a value and then they double and triple from those levels. And then all of a sudden they're back in the black again. Well, not all of a sudden, maybe five years later, they're back in the black again. But to me, once you get to that scary point, that 40 to 50 percent, you have to wonder. As I often say, it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. Take a look at the energies, for instance. We'll take a look at those in just one second. Metals and mining, too. They look like a value recently. In fact, we started seeing some potential emerging trends there. But now it looks like they're going back to retest their old low. So just because something is low doesn't mean it can go lower. Okay. Now, with stops, keep in mind that the longer you intend to hold, okay, and this is straight out of the article I just published, or just submitted for publication, so I'll have it on the website soon on the free reports. But the higher, the bigger your stop is going to have to be, okay? So somebody's asking about five-minute charts. So, yeah, if you're trading a five-minute chart, your stop might be this big. But if you're trading a five-day chart, if you're trading over try to five-day holding period, it's going to be that big. And if it's five months, it's going to be that big. And if it's five years, it'll be that big, okay? And that's why you have those big drawdowns with longer-term systems. You're also not going to be very correct in longer-term trading. And I've done a lot of research years and years ago, and it seems like about the best I could do with a mechanical system is about 28%. And that's pretty much right in line with uh, any other long-term trader if you look at it. So if you're trying to trade a longer-term trend, by the way, you're going to be wrong 72% of the time or thereabouts. So I would say nearly three out of four times you're going to be wrong. But you make up for it in that other one. But I would much rather hit a little closer to 50, 60% on the trades, okay? And at least be right in a small way and then be able to position myself to hopefully be also right in a big way. So this is why when this is why I trade for the short term so my stop is over here somewhere and then this is why I let it loose it up so I could get to the longer term hopefully get to the longer term trim okay um for those who have to go uh, I I kind of hinted at this last week and I'm going to go ahead and probably make it official well I will make it official but uh just in the meantime email me if you want the stock selection course I'll give you a year free to my core trading service and that way you could learn how to pick stocks and then you can watch me pick stocks for a year compare your notes to mine kind of the teach a man to fish and um give a man a fish type of thing and by the way it's like the people who eventually get the methodology and it's like well dave you know i'm, I'm off my own now no longer need you it's kind of like whoa, whoa, whoa hang on keep me on your staff OK, and somebody thought I was uh, that would be an insulting position for me. No, I don't care what you call me, <laughs> but keep me on your staff. Maybe I might find a stock that you don't see or I might see something in the market that you might not see. So kind of treat me like an institutional client would do as long as I'm doing OK. Keep you on your staff and um, compare your notes to mine. Now, how do you loosen those trailing stops over time? So we're trailing, we have a tight stop going in. And let's say we got a little pullback and we're trying to get that little swing trade out. Now the stop is fairly tight. Let's say it's like right here and this far away from the market. We're going to try to transfer it to transition, I should say, to a longer term trend follower where we have a very long term stop. By the way, I used to go in, and I've talked about this quite a bit, but I'll mention it again. When I did presentations and articles and stuff, I'd go in and I would go to each day and see where my stop was and I would plot the uh, stop. And it would look like that on a chart. And then because it's it's a tremendous amount of time, it's a tremendous amount of work. Now when I do the examples, I just kind of get an average of those stops and then I just kind of draw a line through them like this. 
the only thing that that has caused is a lot of people say, is that a longer term moving average? And the answer is no, but I think that we've kind of backed into something there. And I think that that's maybe one way you could set stops. Maybe you could start off with a shorter term moving average as your stop, and then your stop becomes longer and longer and longer term moving averages because eventually my stop being transitions. Write this down. I think this is important stuff, good stuff. I'm still going to do it my way. I'm still going to use discretion and eyeball it and adjust my stops accordingly. But I think if you're trying to mechanize something or if you can't wrap your head around it or need a little help trying to get a feel for things, then maybe think about this. Maybe you start off with that shorter term moving average and then you add days to that moving average with time. So you transfer to that longer term moving average, which is still going to move in the intended direction of the trade of the chart, but it's just going to do so more slowly. Now, I would prefer to just – the only problem with that that I could perceive just off the top of my head is that if the stock does base for a while, it might catch up to the price, and then you might end up stopped out right before it takes off. But, yes, to answer that question, this jagged line, if you looked at each my stops as they were set, will eventually kind of look like a longer-term moving average. Now, often you don't have to do anything to let your stop widen now. Let's say the stock is here. Your stop is here. Okay. You've got that much distance. Let's say the stock goes up a little bit. Well, if you leave your stop where it is, don't do anything, then you have effectively widened your stop by this amount, by Y. Okay. Whatever that is. So one of the things that you could do is a game I call keep the change. Let's say you're trading a $30 stock and it goes up um, 30 cents. Okay. Well, do you really want to go in and adjust your stop 30, 30 cent higher? I mean, you know, markets don't really work that way. It doesn't have to be that perfect. It doesn't have to be that precise. So what? 30 cents. Let it go 30 cents. Big deal. Next day it goes up another 14 cents. Okay? Don't bother adjusting your stop. So over a couple of days period, now you've let your stop widen out by a half a point. Now, eventually, if that keep the change starts getting really big, you have to start bumping that stop up again. But there are little things you can do that will allow that stop to widen out. Remember, we're making that transition from that shorter term trade with that fairly tight stop to the longer term trade with that somewhat looser stop. Okay. Now, let's say you're fortunate and you, you start really getting some really nice moves. Okay. So on a big move, let's say a stock goes up three bucks. Well, if it goes up three bucks, OK, then maybe only raise your stop two bucks. So your stop is gaining ground. OK, so overall, boring overnight gaps, if you get stopped out, you're still going to make two dollars more than you were the day before. OK, but you're not going to raise it that full three dollars. You're letting you're giving the stop more room, stock more room, by the way. And I've done presentations on this in the past, and I think I've got some articles out there on that under free report. So uh, keep an eye out for that or, or look for those, I should say. If you're trading properly, there's two things that are going to happen on your winning momentum trades. Number one, the stock is going to begin to accelerate and move in your favor and do so quickly. Okay. So with that comes an expansion and volatility. So when that stock jumps three points, provided that it's a not a super volatile stock and a three point is a normal move, but let's say it drops three points and let's say it's a little bit lower price stock. So it's a significant move based on the historical volatility of the stock. Historical being the key word in that sentence, okay, based on what it looked like looking backwards, obviously then that volatility has begun to jump. So you, you're ending up with a little bit of a different animal, okay? You traded, uh, you, you went into a trade in a stock that had volatility of, let's just say, let's just make, pull a number out there, 30, okay? Well, all of a sudden, that volatility of stock is now at 40 on an HV basis. So you have a little bit different animal on your hand. That's a good problem to have. And if you go in and look at the chart, 
that I talked about, I showed the volatilities like this, and then the volatility does this, and the price is also doing that, okay? So you want to start adjusting not only for the longer-term trend, so hopefully you're going to be in there for a long, long time, but you're also adjusting for the jump in volatility, and that's a good problem to have. Now, see, Jim, Jim's, you know, I said I beat the dead horse and all this, and I, don't, I didn't feel like covering again, but, you know, Jim's got a point. You know, wind me up, get me started, and that's where a lot more things come out. And I think the more you understand about what you're doing and how you're trying to capture, A, an explosion in volatility and an explosion in price, or I should say just the opposite, explosion in price, which comes with an explosion in volatility. So wrapping your head around that, now you begin to understand why you can, you should uh, let that stop. Why now? By the way, I ended, again, here we're backing into something else on a different tangent here. But, you know, what's surprising is when I am fortunate enough to have some winners in a portfolio, I find that a lot of clients don't stick with them. Why? Well, because having winners is a good problem to have, but it's still a problem nonetheless. Because they begin to mentally monetize the profits. Well, I could take that money. I could buy this. I could pay this bill. I could do that. Okay. As opposed to trying to keep that trading account a little bit more pure and make as much money as possible in that account. And then maybe after the trade's over, do some of these things. They begin to mentally monetize them. And then that's okay. It's fun to do. But the problem with that is when you begin to draw down a little bit on that then you start thinking about the money lost of what you could have done with the money lost. You're not going to get top dollar on the trade, but you need to look at where you start and where you end. And as long as that's a positive and you caught the crux of the move, then pat yourself on the back and move on. As I've said quite a bit, like George Carlin used to say, when you buy a pet, it's going in badly. When you're in a trade, it's going in badly. Okay. Two things are going to happen. Either you're going to lose money on the trade, or you're going to make money. Well, make money, that doesn't sound like a bad thing. Well, but you're going to have to give up some of those open profits in the end when that trend does end. And that's just life, okay? As, um, what's his name? Ed Sakota was, was speaking to us at the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts uh, Conference. And I think the reason he shut down his public fund was that he was having the same equity swings on a percentage basis, when the fund was smaller, he was having the same exact swings when the funds were much larger. So clients of his were witnessing million dollars swings or million dollar swings in their account. And percentage wise, it was the same swing as it was before, but most of them, they could handle it much easier when it was a much smaller account but once it got to that big, the swings were too large for him. And I think that's why he closed down that public uh, fund, which was kind of interesting. He was a fascinating individual, by the way. Now, once a stop is at an average, at an obvious position failure, then that's one thing that does kind of happen is if you let it widen out, widen out, widen out, at some point, you, you look at it and say, well, geez, it's like way down here. Stock is way up here. That's going to be one hell of an ouch, okay? So once you do get to that point where it's one hell of an ouch, then you know that your stop is probably wide enough for a longer-term trend. And the ultimate goal would be for this market to have a very deep retracement, not hit your stop, and then take off and make the real true move out over the next several years. That would be... That would be the ideal goal, the ultimate goal. But once you're to that ouch point, at that point, and then this is all in, in, in a little bit less detail, but this is all in that article, so make sure you read that. Uh, keep an eye on, the, on those special reports. I'll try to get it up as soon as possible. All I have is a draft, and I need to figure out um, whether I need to wait for the final version. And, and So there's a few logistics involved. But it should be up within a week at least. But keep an eye out for that. But the point is, once you are plenty far enough away, whatever that is, but it should be pretty obvious, okay? That stop should be at a point where it looks like it's either be the mother of all deep retracements or a failure. It should be like right outside of that, that mother of all deep retracements. 
then you can go back to more of a one for one kind of trailing stop basis. Okay. And then let's say that um, it's got a big base and takes off. You might want to start trailing on a one for one basis to get up to this base at least. Okay. And then keep the stop moving from there. Okay. So obviously let's say a stock does this and you're trailing that stop well it shouldn't come back to this base so as long as you're below that base then maybe you can go back to the one for one uh trailing bases at least until you get to the bottom of that let's call it a consolidation so it makes life easier the bottom of that consolidation Okay, and then even once you do that, you can still play like to keep the change game to let it widen out a little further. Um, in an ideal world, stock goes up base, stocks goes up bases, and your stop begins to look like this. Okay. All right, let's um, cover a couple of these questions in here real quick. What time frame do you look at on your charts? Ever look at a five-minute chart or shorter? Uh, I look at daily charts mostly, but we're going to look at some weekly charts here in just a minute. And uh, this YouTube I'm getting ready to talk about, we looked at a monthly chart. And in recent columns, we looked at a monthly chart. Patterns are fractal. And the market's going to turn on a 60-minute chart long before it's going to turn on a daily chart. The problem is when you get below anything below, let's say, a daily chart, then the chart gets a little noisy, okay? Unless you're coming off of major, major highs. Now, I, I haven't looked at it, or that I, I know I haven't looked at it recently, but I bet if you went in and looked at the S&P 500, I think I might have looked at it. I mean, I want to dig myself a hole here. But I'd be willing to bet if you looked at S&P 500, you had a bow tie on the hourly chart as it rolled over from all-time highs. And that was your first sign that the market was in trouble. But you need a daily chart to kind of filter out some of that noise. Now, if you are, by the way, if you are day trading, which I, I'm not a big fan of, but occasionally I will take an intraday position trade, especially in a market like Forex. And I use the word intraday position trade because I'm trying to get in and I'm trying to stay in for the entire day and maybe even hopefully a few days on the trade as opposed to being in and out, in and out all day. If you make it 50 trades a day, then God bless you. And I think you're not going to live very long. Uh, I think your heart's going to give out, your head's going to give out, something's going to give out. I know a lot of day traders who have gone crazy, literally. So I pick on you guys a lot, uh, but for those of you who could do it, God bless you. I think we're only wired to make so many decisions. So, yeah, sometimes I'll look at an intraday chart. I try to avoid it at all costs in stocks because I, I, I know my ultimate goal is to catch that swing trade, and the ultimate, ultimate goal is to catch that longer-term trade. And if I'm looking at an intraday chart, I'm going to – be inclined to do things that I shouldn't be doing and see things that really aren't there, at least on the time frame that I want to be on. Okay. The ultimate goal is to catch the ultimate trend. And the way to do that is to start on a daily chart and stick with that as long as it works in your favor. Now, I think it's hard to trade off a weekly chart unless you're getting a major, major signal like we are now because that move might be over with by the time the weekly chart begins to kick in. In the case of the overall market, I don't think so. And we're going to look at a weekly bow tie here in just one second. And, a, and of course, the death cross. I guess that's a daily signal. So the weekly bow tie here. Um, I think we've become, oh, when using Rinko bars, does FIB work the same or is the result smooth more? I don't use Rinko bars. I've used uh, a little bit of everything. Uh, Rinko bars, if uh, memory serves, is is something that looks like this on a chart. Uh, but, yeah, I think that if you were looking at a retracement, a retracement is a retracement in price movement, so that's fine. Uh, I don't use point and figure. I tried once. I pointed to the chart and tried to figure out why I lost money. But all jokes aside, point and figure, there's nothing wrong with point and figure. It's just not my style. I'd much rather recognize a, a bar pattern, but yeah, point figure charts make sense to me. I don't use them, but they make sense because they help you to identify support resistance. And I guess that's what a Rinko chart would do. It's been years since I've used uh, all that stuff. 
Yeah, Don says, uh, not the other, not the Don we know, the another Don, a new Don. Everyone has a plan until it gets punched in the face. Yeah, that's uh, Don. Once you start reading a few of my columns, you're going to see that that Tyson quote comes up quite often. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the columns even have a picture of that um, beautiful face with that tattoo and all. I tested audio and it gave me a sound, but I don't hear Dave. Oh, okay. Um, Joel, it, um, I guess I'm saying this for uh, academic purposes, but uh, sometimes a squirrel will get his nuts caught in the wires somewhere between uh, me and you. And But the, the, the local sound is very robust, and the recording will go up to you, YouTube, okay? Okay. Um, I did a YouTube yesterday, and it reiterated a lot of things I've been talking about. But one thing that I think that has happened, and I talked about on YouTube, is I think we've become a little too comfortable with the bull. You know, a nice little bull, and I've got this uh, this guy's playing with his bull. It's kind of uh, kind of amusing behind me. So check out the YouTube when you get a chance. It's only about four minutes long. But the point I'm trying to make is that this is a weekly chart. The point I'm trying to make is since 2009, we have this big blue arrow pointing what up. Now, we did have some pretty serious corrections in here, but on all these corrections, and this one's the most vivid in my mind, October of 2014, the market has turned around and gone back up. Now, I don't want to digress, as I'm prone to do, but you can see this rally up wasn't that impressive from that, that knockout move on the monthly chart even that we had last October. And that's part of the problem is that we've lost some momentum in here. But the point I'm trying to make is that the market, for all intents and purposes, has worked its way higher since 2009. If once you've been around the markets for 10, 20, 30 years, as I have, you'll begin to see things happen. And you'll begin to see a reoccurring pattern of human behavior. Now, if you don't have time or you're impatient to wait 30 years let me just tell you what happens it's like you get a new crop of people that come along every few years and i think that's why technical analysis works and then human nature never changes now by the way with technical analysis we're reading the mind of the market participants okay we're reading their emotions and we're trying to keep our own emotions in check and believe in what we see and not in what we believe and that is one of the many secrets of trading. And the main secret is there is no secret. It's just kind of common sense. But it seems like a new crop of people come along every so often. And since 2009, I think six years of, of mostly progress. We had a flat year or two in here. But six years is a general statement of mostly progress. Six, year, six years of rewarding to buy and hold. There's been some tough trading years in here since 2009. Make no bones about it. And it's frustrating to have a market sell off hard in the middle of the year and then come back by the end of the year. And on a net, net basis, that market did okay. And then you were in there trading this, doing the right thing, allowing those stops to take you out. And you're up against a benchmark that did pretty well, but it didn't do so in a straight line, which had been much easier to follow along. It did so with a lot of whipsaw, which made the buy and hold crowd feel pretty smart. And then it's kind of funny. Again, this getting back to the new crop of traders. Human nature never changes. 2015, I saw it coming. Hey, Dave, I'm trading spreads. Okay. <laughs> Hey, Dave, I'm trading mean reversion or whatever. Okay. Well, that'll work until it don't. Okay. But if that's what you're going to do, just make sure you wrap your head around it and that's all you do. I'm not going to pick on anyone, but there are certain methods I'm not a big fan of. And I don't want to get into arguments with people because I have much better things to do with my time. But if you're going to trade some sort of complex methodology, Make that your life's work, okay, and, and just do that, and that's fine. I don't care. If that's what you want to do, do that. 
But be careful when you're getting into these things and make sure you're not looking at some sort of aberration in, in the market. Okay, whether it be a choppy market, whether it be a market that goes up with lots of really bad corrections in between. Okay. But make sure you understand what's going on and make sure you understand what could go wrong. And as I said in this video that I'm talking about on YouTube, again, it was only like four minutes, so check it out. Quoting Greg Morris, I like to quote Greg Morris a lot because he's been around the block a few times. And he's seen it all, and, and he's got a very common sense approach to the markets. And he says, we treat every sell signal as if it's going to be the big one. And that's how he, he managed billions and billions of dollars throughout his career, is that when things start looking questionable and he starts getting sell signals, what does he do? He sells. So when you have a situation like October of 2014, and the market begins to roll over, what do you do? Well, you have to sell. So you have to treat every signal as if it's going to be the big one. And I think that everyone's grown a little too complacent in this longer term bull market. Okay. Which brings us up to the bear. So is it a bear market developing? I don't know. But the signs are there. And again, not to beat the dead horse. To quote Greg Morris, we treat every sell signal as it's going to be the real deal, okay, the big one. Now, we talked a lot about this death cross, and it's overhyped. It's it's almost laughable the amount of uh, media attention it gets. And by the way, as, um, as I suspected and as um, Rob Hanna has actually proven – it's not going to test out if you buy and sell every time the market crosses the moving average. Trust me on that. There's going to be some whipsaw involved. But it can help to keep you on the right side of the market. And as I said over the past couple of weeks, there have been 40%, 50%, and even 80% drops in the market after a dead cross, a death cross, a dead cross, a death cross. So when you do see these signals developing, you got to watch the market. You certainly don't want to fight the trend or the possible developing trend. And as I've said quite a bit, everything works better with trend. So you could take the simplest of all simple trend following systems and put it on a bunch of trending markets and it's going to print money. But it's what happens in between. That makes it tough. And that's what separates the men from the boys. And again, getting back to the stock selection, that's where it becomes really important. But we did have that moving average crossover. So it's what happens here that becomes important. If this trend begins to develop, then things could get kind of ugly. By the way, just to kind of get it out of the system uh, or get it out of the way, we do have a lot of obviously overhead supply. Anyone who bought during this range uh, might be looking to get out at break even. Okay. The longer and further it stays below this range, the more important this range becomes because the more pain is created on those people. As I've said a thousand times, if it drops below the range, it takes right back off, it goes back to the top of the range. That'll actually test out, by the way. You could wait for a market to drop below a range and then buy it when it takes out the top of the range and vice versa because it faked out those market participants. Again, it's common sense. You're just reading the mind of the market, okay? Keeping your emotions in check, in check and capitalizing on the emotions of others. Obviously, we have a bow tie sell signal. For those who aren't familiar with it, uh, read the reports on my website and watch the numerous YouTubes. But a bow tie is just that. It looks like a bow tie or it looks like a bow tie with the moving averages. And I should have named it a Landry or something because uh, I actually see him mentioned in the media and I never get credit. But I don't want to digress too far. I get bitter, but it's aggravating. This is actually on a weekly basis. Last time we had one off of all-time highs. Your major signals are come come off of all time highs, or at least let's say five or ten year highs. Last time we had a major one was in 2008, early 2008, almost 2007, and before that was in 2000. And I think we all know what happened after that. We had two bear markets, and then the two bull markets that we had in between. Lo and behold, there were weekly bow tie buy signals. Okay, 
So when you're seeing these higher time frame sell signals, it does not mean the end of the world. It does not mean a bear market. But again, let's beat the dead horse with the Greg quote. You have to take every signal seriously. Okay. It's do not to work, if that's a correct English way of saying things, a correct way of saying things. Okay, because it's worked so well for so long. But I think it's very important that you pay attention when you see these signals, and you certainly don't want to fight it. Lately, I've been talking about signs, signals, setup, and trigger. Well, we have all of those, and it triggered just yesterday by dipping below the prior bars low. I think a more significant trigger would be around 1900 round numbers and I would watch that level carefully if we take that out and then obviously if it takes out the prior lows in here then it's going to be a little bit uglier okay all right the other question was well hey Dave you're not giving us a whole lot of setups or a lot to do or the ones you're giving us obviously have it triggered lately so let's let's trade some ETFs well you know I, I don't want to ever want to say that I would never trade ETFs because I do trade ETFs, okay? And I don't want to talk completely against them because maybe someday everybody's going to want an ETF system and or want to just trade ETFs, and then I'll I'll put out some recommendations at ETFs. So I never want to say – I don't want to say don't use them, but there are a few grains of salt you want to look at. One thing I didn't even talk about in this slide is the fact that they are going to be more efficient than individual stocks. So if you're trading – a basket of biotech stocks, it's probably not going to double or triple over a short period of time. But if you work hard to ferret out that little biotech stock that has the opportunity, then maybe it's so inefficient it might double or triple over a short period of time. So sometimes that diversification can become diversification. I don't want to go uh, too far on that because I've kind of gone long today. But let me just point out a few things so right before the show I looked at the ETFs there were over 1500 or about 1500 of them in my database which is just ridiculous that's a ridiculous amount okay uh, I started them by volume and there was only about 550 I think it was 547 that had, had over 100k volume now you could dip a little bit below 100k on average volume where you're trading at ETF but they, you do have to deal with the spread issue. They could be getting a little, you could get a little frictional cost on that. Uh, as I said, I talk, I'm, I'm friends with Greg, and I asked Greg about some of these thinner ones, and, and they could actually call the floor and make a market. Well, as a private trader, you don't have that capability to do that. So you do want to trade slightly more liquid ones, liquid ones, if you are going to trade them. But out of those five, out of those 1,500, you could toss out the thinner ones. And let's say you're left with 550. Well, you certainly want to toss out the three times leverage fund. And the question is, the reason is, they're going to require a three times as wide stop. Do the math on that, okay? Let's say you're trading um, ABC ETF, okay? And you have a one point stop, a $1 stop. Well, let's say this is a three times leverage, so let's call it three ABC. Okay, so you have to have a $3 stop. And in order to trade a $3 stop, your position size, as we just learned, is going to be one third the amount. So do all the math on this, and you come back to this. Now, that's if you're position trading. If you want to make a crazy-ass day trade in these things, knock yourself out. Okay, and that's fine. And that's probably the best, highest and best use for something like a three times stupid leverage fund. So I would... Avoid two-time leverage, three-time leverage, or any leverage in general. Um, inverted funds, as a general statement, the tracking errors are abysmal. Now, there's nothing wrong with the company, as I think it was Stephen Place pointed out when I talked about how these, these ETFs have horrible tracking errors. They're doing what they said they're going to do. They're tracking the, day, the daily change, okay? But when you're tracking these daily changes on a short basis – then your tracking error longer term becomes abysmal. So sometimes people will get into an ETF and the market will, let's say it's an inverse ETF, the market moves down as it should, okay, to make the ETF go up, and the ETF actually loses money. Well, that's what's called a tracking error. And if you start doing the math on that, 
it gets a little convoluted, but it kind of goes back to that drawdown thing. If the market goes down 50%, it's got to come back 100% to break even. Well, those little tiny bitty tracking errors day over day can make a big difference. Now, if the, if the market is the mother of all downtrends, like 2008, I think we did have a couple of those reverse ETFs for the clients uh, who don't actually short in the portfolio. And they actually did okay longer term. If the market makes a significant move over a significant amount of time, then it's okay to have that track of error is not as big of a deal. But like right now, we're just kind of chopping around, trying to work our way lower. You're going to have a little bit more problem with that tracking era. So as a general statement, I would avoid the inverted funds. I know Jim was asking us, uh, asking me, hey, can we go in and buy some inverted funds? As a general statement, it's a bad idea. So again, if the big trend does ensue, then yes, you'll be okay. But anything less, the daily grind will wear you down. I don't want to go get too much further than that. Just trust me on that. Google tracking era and Google uh, inverted fund tracking era, and you'll know as much as me. Now, you can also toss out dozens and dozens and dozens of short-term bond funds. Bill, Mint, Flot, uh, there's, there's, there's tons of them, okay? That's pretty much useless. I, I use them as placeholders in my momentum list when I'm, when I'm weeding out stocks and I don't have any good stocks to put back in. But other than that, I, I don't really see any use for those um, short-term funds. And there's like, I mean, how many muni funds do you need? There's like hundreds of muni funds, so throw those out too. Um, and then how many tracking funds, seriously, do you need? Uh, how many S&P tracking funds? Now, some of them like RSP, that's worth a look because that's the unweighted S&P. That makes sense. But how many tracking funds in addition to the SPY do you really need for the S&P 500? Okay, so you can throw out all those. So there's 1,500 of them, but you can throw out 1,000 right off the bat. You could probably throw out another three, 400 or more just by weeding out all this fluff. Okay. And then you have all these, you know, big cap, the medium cap, small cap, and all that. Do you really need these? I don't know. Maybe there's some use to some of those, but you, obviously you don't need 10 big cap stock funds. Okay. Uh, VIX funds. These VIX ETFs, most people don't understand them. I don't fully understand them. Okay. But things aren't as they seem. Just remember that. Larry McMillan gave us a speech at the APTA meeting a couple years ago. And every now and then he'll he'll repeat some of these VIX talks, which he gives a really good speech on the VIX, in that the these VIX funds are based on the futures, and futures have a decay, and it gets really muddy really fast. So unless you really, really know what you're doing, again, this is where you might want to make it your life's work, like Larry has, okay? Larry could trade VIX funds. He knows what he's doing. He understands them. But a lot of people are buying them thinking they're getting a hedge in the markets. No, no, they don't really work that way. You're going to be unpleasantly surprised if you're trying to buy these VIX funds, thinking that's going to brace you for a shock in the market. So be really careful. And again, unless you really, really know what you're doing, maybe trading reversion to the mean in a certain kind of fashion with these things, then avoid them. Um, now, some people think, well, let's take an S&G trade and reverse leverage beaten up ETF. So you look at an ETF and it looks like this. It's like reverse triple leverage. It's way down here. Well, don't even think about that because you're thinking like, okay, it's at it's at two dollars. It could only go to one dollar or zero, whatever. Who cares, right? Well, what'll happen is and you could just hold it forever. Well, they're gonna reverse split you to death, okay? So they'll they'll split it, reverse split it. It'll be back up here again, and now you'll have one third of the shares. It'll come down here. Then they'll go back up. They reverse split it, and then you have like a third of the third of the share. So eventually, they'll get all your money out of you by reverse splitting those. So I would avoid those. Phil says, VIX funds are great to trade if you understand them. Amen, brother Phil. Some are way overpriced as protection for risk, but risk can change directions uh, on you. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, yeah, just know what you're doing, okay? And there are certain relationships between various VIX funds that do tell you something, and that's a lot of the research that – that uh, Larry uh, has gotten into and that sometimes you might want to be long one and short one and short one and long one, whatever the case may be. But that's not my forte. I, I try to keep it simple and just look at the charts for trends. Okay. Uh, currency funds are okay. I prefer the outright Forex, but I'm, I'm guessing that I guess you have some holding power 
I was looking at FXY. The yen looks like it's made a bottom in uh, the ETF. So maybe, well, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll put a currency ETF in the, in the core trading service if the opportunity presents itself. But they're much lower in HV. So you're going to have to hold them for a while to get your move out of them. But that also gives you kind of holding power. If you think you have the mother all bottom, let's say in the yen, which I think it's possible, um, then by all means, uh, pursue a currency ETF. So as a general statement, ETFs seem a lot better on the surface than I think they really are for the most part. And again, I didn't want to get too far into this, but that's, that could probably be as a, I was putting together a slide this morning. I could probably do a lot more in ETFs. I think some relative strength work in ETFs is really cool and really fun. And there's some people out there that have done some really great things. And it's pretty simple to mimic. You could actually do a relative strength in, in, in uh, super charts, super charts, telecharts. I'm showing my age, super charts. Anybody remember super charts? Uh, telecharts. Also, you could do it in... Um, and I think Metastock allows you to do this relative strength sorts and all. So you could do this relative strength analysis, but that's, again, that's another form of you need to make sure you wrap your head around what that means and what you're doing and understand the nuances of relative strength. But the relative strength stuff kind of dovetails into what I do, which is kind of cool because of the momentum and all. And I'm, I'm kind of a fan of that more so than, than a lot of these other things that I'm, I'm sort of against. Okay. Um, these are my random thoughts from last week or week before. Uh, we'll get to that, uh, Andre. That's it. Yeah, it's an ETF. We'll take a look at it. Uh, setups are tough to find on the short side. It's by the market. So the market sold off, and it looks like it's going to hell in a handbasket. But then it, it it did this, okay? So it's like all over the place. And ideally, on a short side, you want to see one or two updates, and then you want to see the market continue lower, market being individual stock. Because this way, the most people are trapped on the wrong side of the market coming off the highs, and they don't have a chance to get off the hook. There's no jockeying for position, and it's just easier because once that market begins to implode after just a brief little, let's say, a one or two bar pullback, then these people are in trouble. Whereas if, they, if it just chops around like it's been, eh, it gets harder and harder to trade. Obviously, we have the overhead supply. We talked about that already. Weekly bow tie, we just talked about that. Uh, if you're going to have a bow tie, most of the time you're going to have a first thrust. And if you're going to have a first thrust, eventually you're going to have a bow tie. Moving average is sometimes a little slower to catch up the price, but you will have uh, a, usually a bow tie after first thrust. And, of course, the death cross. Okay. Um, I left this in yet again. On your stops, obviously, on any long positions, uh, be super selective. We'll talk about stock selection again in a second right here. Seek out inefficiencies. Okay, right now there's a couple. And a couple will be the key word in that sentence, IPOs. Um, I, I might have to change the graphic on my website. I've got the, the IPOs on fire, little graphic with the little flames coming out of the, uh, the, the up arrow. Well, I guess I'm ready to change that to some IPOs are on fire. The the cool thing is, as I did in the I as I talked about in the IPO course, the great thing about IPOs is sometimes or most of the time they either fly or they die. Okay. Now during the great bull market of the last couple of years we had in the IPOs, it wasn't completely clear about the flies and the dies. Okay. But for the most part, that was a general statement. Right now, the demarcation is pretty serious. IPO after IPO after IPO is dying, but the ones that are going up might be worth a look. So seek out those inefficiencies, and I'm working hard to find those right now. Uh, seek out stocks that can trade contra to the overall market. Metals and mining and gold, or metals and mining such as gold uh, and other metals and mining, and of course, energies. Well, Neither one of those areas is doing too well right now. We'll take a look at those in just one second. As I say, sometimes it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. And obviously, wait for entries, honor your stops once triggered, and all these other things that I preach on a daily basis. On the short side, be super selective. Find stocks at high levels versus those sold out longer term. Go back and watch the last three shows, okay? Someone asked me about a stock that looks like this. I'm like, as a possible short, yeah, it looks pretty good. Someone asked me about a stock that looks like this as a possible short. Well, has it already ran its course, okay? And that's what's kind of interesting is sometimes those stocks at lower levels become a source of funds, and then the money goes to stocks at higher levels, okay? 
it's kind of interesting the way markets work like that. Um, and again, same as alongside on your stops, wait for entries once triggered. Again, for those of you just joining us, um, if you do go with the stock selection course, then you get uh, one year free to the trading service. So let me teach you how to trade stocks and then watch me pick them. Let me teach you how to pick stocks and then watch me pick them. And then um, I think that's the best way to learn it. Learn it in theory and then watch it in practice. Recent IPOs are holding up better than the indices. I will send you a chart. Oh, I, I fully agree with you on that. And sometimes what happens is, uh, did Yogi Bear say that? I thought I said that. That's uh, Logi, Yogi Bear? <laughs> um, I thought that was my saying. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim it. I don't care. Um, yeah, I agree with you, Phil. One thing that I've noticed in the markets over the years of the, doing this is that sometimes when the overall market gets kind of, kind of iffy, then the super speculative issues can outperform the market. So as Phil has pointed out, and he actually probably has some research to back it up knowing Phil, that the uh some the ipos that are surviving or really beating the market and that's possible how about etfs versus mutuals um well that's kind of an open that's kind of an open ended statement well, what mutuals and uh you know i don't know um if you if you i think if you are going to trade in mutual funds then you need to have some sort of technical approach and it does not have to be that fancy. I know someone that that does a uh, newsletter in Europe on uh, mutual funds, and he's got a very simple way of doing things. And it's something that he's actually encouraged me to replicate over here. I just, that's just, there's just not enough time. Uh, so I would just encourage you, without giving away his system, I would encourage you to just do something really, really simple, and use stops, so to speak, plot that performance. And if it's if the if it's bow tied down on a weekly, you might want to get out of that mutual fund. As long as it's above the moving averages, then you might want to stay in that mutual fund. So that would be my moving average trading, uh, my mutual fund trading system. All right. Um, this was actually from another presentation, but obviously David DaveLander.com. You got any questions? There's a lot of stuff at DaveLander.com, so check it out. And then my YouTube channel, oops, is a uh, YouTube slash C for custom, and then Dave Landry. And all this, if you just go to the sidebar, this, this, this needs to be cleaned up a little bit, admittedly, but if you go to the sidebar, all upcoming appearances and world tour dates and everything are here, and then you can find me here on YouTube on that page. All right, let's get to the charts, finally. Oh, Yogi died? Wow, what a bummer. <laughs> I read a book by him. It was really good. Um, I forget the name, but it was uh, it was good. I don't think he meant to. I don't think he sought out to say the things he did in the way he did. But they really did. He, the way he kind of turned everything on his head, it made a lot of sense. Which was kind of ironic, don't you think? Um. Let's take a look at the overall market real quick. I don't want to beat the dead horse here, but because uh, we talked about it quite a bit already. Um, P's, S&P 500. Let's go to blank chart. Uh, you know, I've never seen such a more orderly. I, I know on a daily basis it's chopped around a bit, but I've never seen such an orderly sell-off in years and years of doing this. And um, this is what scares me. It's almost too textbook in nature, but... Like, take a look at the weekly chart. Look how clean this is, okay? You got overhead supply. You got a thrust lower. You got a pullback. And then now you got trend continuation, okay? Now, getting on board hasn't been that easy. But watching it unfold, um, it sure looks like the market still is in a lot of trouble. As I've been saying quite a bit, if you take a look at, like, a monthly chart, we had a TKO, trend knockout on a monthly chart. But the market didn't make a whole lot of progress from that TKO. And then now we've pulled back too close to that range, okay? Or the, the bottom of that range, I should say, that knockout bar. Ideally, thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, thrust, rinse and repeat. You don't want the pullback 
to pull back to below the prior pullback, okay? So in this particular case, so if you end up with that, you end up with something that looks like this, okay? And that's kind of like double top-ish looking, or rounded top looking. NASDAQ, same sort of action, retraced back up to its overhead supply, stalled right at it in a textbook manner, which is interesting, fascinating, depends on how you want to look at it. Um, and it too is pulling back into the area of its prior little pullback in here. So that's concerning. So lots of signals out there. Will this one be, be the big one? I don't know, but every top is going to have a sell signal, but not every sell signal will be a top. So that's what makes the tough, that's the tough part of this business. Okay. Sometime it work and sometime it don't. Getting to, let's take a look at the rusty real quick and then we'll look at some of these sectors and then uh, start asking about stocks now, if you like. I went really long today. Sorry about that. Um, big thrust down in the rusty downtrend remains intact there. So far, it's pulled back. So far, resuming its downtrend. Not looking very pretty. Um, what's concerning in these sectors is that there seems to be a debacle de jour. Notice drugs and especially biotech, a little bit more exacerbated in biotech. Was kind of pulling back in here, and then it got creamed, and the market really wasn't whack too bad on that day if memory serves what day was that that was on um 921 what the market do on 921 uh well i got yeah it was actually up okay so market was up on 921 and biotech got whacked uh what percent five percent or something so it was actually down in a day okay yeah, Howard, uh, IWM has a downtrend. Flava? FLAV? Is that a question? or Andre wants to look at BIS and the ETFs. BIS is, um, BIS is biotech. Um, it's a short, though, so and it's ultra short, so I think that's leveraged. So I hear you, and it looks like a mother of all bottom, okay? Multiple head, shoulders, whatever you want to call it. But just be really careful with that because being an inverted short type of deal, you can get to a lot of trouble really quick. Maybe just uh, let's take a look at like the BBH. You know, of course, you got this crazy bar in here. What's another one? IBB is still is that still around? Uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, maybe short something like this as opposed to trying to buy that inverted uh, fund. Oh, barbecue flavor. Hey, if. Okay, XPI. I'm sorry, I, I deleted it. Was that an actual symbol? Is there a symbol flavor? Yeah, the XPI, a little bit cleaner than everything else. You can see, let's take a look at like a bow tie uh, on a daily, there it is, and on a weekly, okay? Uh, not quite a bow tie on a weekly, but yeah, stick a fork in that. That looks like it's done. Short the XPI versus buying the BIS, okay? Would be my suggestion. Okay. Um, I don't like UPS. I find it to be a choppy, thick kind of choppy type of stock, hard to trade. Um, I guess it's toppy looking, but it would have to break down below this range for me to uh, get excited about it. Peter wants to know about AKBA. Well, it looks like it's trying to bottom the. Only thing I don't like, I'm not really crazy about stocks that make these huge gaps. It's how's, how does Donald Trump say? It's huge, it's huge, it's huge gap. Make a huge gap over a couple of days, um, or one day in this case. I don't mind a gap in the direction of the trend. In fact, I actually like them. But the majority of its move was just this one big day up. It doubled in price over one day. I think they get a little squirrely after that. A little too dangerous to trade, so I would avoid it. Phil wants to know about GLD as an ETF. Um, I think gold's trying to bottom out in here, okay? It's going to have a lot of overhead supply, but obviously it's having a good day today. I've noticed some of these more speculative gold stocks that have been really beaten up or finally beginning to bottom out a little bit, but I think it's more of a process than an event. So on follow through, maybe, but it's got a lot of overhead supply to deal with. That's that's the only thing I don't like about it. Kirks, K-E-R-X, K-E-R-X. 
that's obviously in a downtrend. I think it's too late to short it. This would be a stock that's sold out. You want to try to catch them as they're rolling over from major highs. I mean, just take a look at the light. Let's just throw up the spiders, okay? Let's throw up the weekly spiders, okay? It's, weekly spiders are rolling over from major highs, okay? I'd much rather short a market that looks like that, that has the potential to do this, than short a market that looks like this, that has the potential to do this, okay? So you want to match your pattern to the market, as I preach quite often. ACI is too too volatile. This is one. This is a coal stock. We've been watching this one. Uh, two hundred and ninety five on the historical volatility reading. By the way, I'll give you all these formulas. I don't. There's nothing that I do that's proprietary. Um, it's just too crazy. Went from two to ten. That's a five hundred percent move. Then came all the way back in. I would leave it alone um, unless you want to see it as an option that never never expires, which is a bad idea. I probably I'm not even going to dig open that can of worms right now. TRVN. T T R B N T R B N. Um, a little too much, too fast. I mean, it's going up 100% over a short period of time. Uh, you know, right now that might be all you're left with is some of these crazy stocks. So this is what I call a toddler. It's a relatively new IPO. It's been out for a couple of years, max. Uh, but it's a pretty serious move over a short period of time. Now, remember earlier I talked about stocks that make a really big move. What you want to see before you even think about a stock like this, would be a really deep retracement. So like Justice Powder Stewart, I'll know when I see it. If we have a deep retracement on a stock like this, then maybe I might consider it. But as a general statement, a little crazy. But good eye, Don. I see where you're coming from. Good to see you with the trend, finally. Uh, no, too crazy. From two to seven over a short period of time, no. That's just too crazy. And then look, you know, it goes from it goes from five to two. So it loses 70% of its value, then it goes up 400%. That's just way too crazy. Stay away from that. Casey for Thomas. Hey, Thomas, good to see you. Um, yeah, that looks pretty good as a general statement, first glance. Longer term uptrend. It looks okay. It did pull back to its prior little consolidation. Uh, right now, you got to be really careful not to go after something because it's the dog with least fleas okay so within context of this market this stock looks fantastic but you got to ask yourself if i was seeing this stock in a fantastic market would it still look so great on a relative basis so i think you found the dog with the least fleas i mean if you really wanted to place a trade then yeah it looks okay but it did pull back to its prior pullback in here. Uh, it also kind of kind of rallied up and then came back in. You want a pullback to sort of look like this. Or if it does do this, maybe just on a little smaller basis, and that's what I call a trend pivot pullback uh, for my second book. Uh, it looks okay. But, again, the other thing, if it, it picking it apart, let's take a look at the net-net change. So over the last month and change, it's going up like uh, 2% or even two months. Yeah, almost two months. Is that right? Yeah. So I think it's lost some steam. I think it's lost some momentum. I think I would pass on that, but I hear you on a relative strength basis. It looks fantastic. Uh, speaking of TRVN, maybe a high tight flag forming TRVN. Well, that's the problem is I would not trade a high tight flag in a stock like that. Okay. If a stock goes straight up like this, you don't want to trade a little flag pattern. Uh, you know, something like that, uh, whatever that stock we were just looking at, was it Casey or what was it? Like something like this. Yeah, maybe a nice shallow pullback is okay. But something like that, and this thing went up 100% over a few days in here or a few weeks, okay? So you want to see this thing have the mother of all corrections, knock some people out, and then look to try to get long on that next up leg, should it ensue. USO entry, USO with below the recent highs, I think, would still is still viable. Uh, it's too many days of the pullback, but if it could take out, let's say, this little pivot high here, I think it's possible. We are long this one. This is the only stock that's long in the portfolio. Um, you know, by the way, I don't try to time the service, meaning that I don't try to tell people now is a good time, but I think now is a good time to start trading it again because uh, we had some winners and then we got stopped out of those and so the portfolio is pretty much empty except for USO. So we're flat for the most part. 
and you would be flat as, as as the portfolio coming in. And I think that we're beginning to see this market turn, and I think we could see some opportunities really soon. And if you are an existing client, you want to come back, let me know. I've been making a screaming deal for everyone. I, I you know, the great thing about prior clients is they know how it works, and it doesn't require as much hand holding. Uh, I'm happy with you guys too, but um, yeah, this is a this is a little flag like you talked about, or somebody just mentioned. It looks okay. I, I slightly, I prefer a slightly deeper pullback. Like I said last weekend, with last week, a uh, little bit too extreme move lower here. But um, I, I, this this would be the dog with the least fleas. In fact, this looks pretty good. Maybe on a slightly deeper pullback. Um, you know, the problem is you're going after just one or two or three little stocks out there. So for me, they're going to really have to knock my socks off and be a really, really great setup. I'm willing to pass on something like JetBlue, even though it looks okay. Now, you know, maybe in a few days from now, if it pulls back, I might change my tune a little bit. But as a general statement, I really have to be blown away by a setup in order to take it in this environment. Okay, yesterday, a huge amount of puts on USL. Well, the problem with that, okay, it's a huge amount of puts. Is that bullish or bears? I don't know. Um, huge amount of puts, but they might be hedging a call position that they put on some other day. I mean, you never know who's buying what or who's doing what. So don't don't get too caught up in that. I think you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. FSM, and I'm going to have to wrap things up here shortly. Uh, no, not yet, uh, James. I can see what you're saying. It's kind of longer term. It's kind of bottoming out. Kind of has that, that left side of the head and shoulder pattern. But uh, a little too early on that. Okay. All right. I know we're not going to get to everyone today. Let's see if we can get to some uh, LPCN. Um, well, this is a case where you've pulled back to your prior pullback. So and then this pullback is in this prior pullback. So it just does it. Yes, it's worked its way higher, but it's kind of erratic lately. So, okay. Uh, we didn't get to everyone, but uh, we're going to have to shut things down based on the time constraints. I want to thank everybody for coming. As you can tell, I love doing these shows. I have a blast doing them. Uh, anything you want to, any questions you want to ask, feel free to ask uh, in email. And if it's not a quick answer, as you can see, I'll be happy to use it as fodder for uh, next week's show. If we don't talk again between now and then, everyone have a fantastic weekend. I hope to see you guys and girls here again next week. Uh, thank you so much.